Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to this final part of the four-part series on SIF and LIDAR. In part three, we covered the fundamentals of SIF, uh, how it's measured from space and examples of application areas that this measurement can support. Today, we will cover the different satellite SIF data sets, their characteristics, and where they can be accessed. This part will be covered by Karen Ewan from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who's the OCO2 Science Data Applications Lead. And this will then be followed by a demo with OCO2 and TROPOMI data, showing participants how to open, interpret, and analyze the data to identify uh, areas of um, vegetation stress. So this part will be covered by Dr. Philippe Kohler from a, a researcher at the California Institute of Technology. Uh, you will not be expected to follow along with this demonstration during the session. Uh, we have all the links in the uh, presentation that we'll be showing on slides 17 and 18. And you can then do this, repeat this demo or do this demo at your own time. We will have the recording of this demonstration available within 24 hours after the presentation for you to go through it at your own pace. So with that, let's get started. For part four, we will be going through the uh, background information, including the introduction to the SIF products, data sets and data, and then we will launch into the tools and tutorial. Before we begin the tutorial portion of today's presentation, let's recap and also provide some additional context about SIF. As you have learned, SIF is the energy that is re-emitted as fluorescence during photosynthesis. Due to the sensitivity and spectral range of certain instruments on these satellites, we are able to measure SIF from space. Since SIF has a direct relationship to the photosynthetic process, changes in vegetation due to various factors can technically be observed by SIF over traditional vegetation indices, such as NDVI. Over the years, various instruments and missions have flown that have demonstrated and refined the capability of measuring SIF from space. Both GOM on board the ERS-2 and Skiamaki and Anviset were spectrometers that were designed to measure other atmospheric gases and clouds, but their spectrum range also covered SIF. As research progressed and demonstrated capability grew over the last decade, the overlap of other instruments such as GOM-2 and GOSAT provided SIF measurements and the ability to begin making comparison analyses. When high spatial and temporal resolution measurements of SIF came along with the launches of OCO2 and TROPOMI and OCO3 on ISS, the research and science application of SIF became even more prolific varied and exciting. There are new emissions on the horizon that will continue this important measurement. The SIF signal was discovered because it is in the spectral range of the spectrometers that were designed to be measuring other atmospheric species. The actual SIF signal in the spectra is weak, and a lot of work has gone into ensuring the viability and quality of the SIF data products. Depending on the instrument, the product resolutions vary spatially and spectrally. Therefore, it is important to pay attention and not assume, but also understand the noted caveats in working with the data. Notably, that the spatial resolution is coarse, yet the spectral resolution is high. The measurement is very sensitive and subject to uncertainties. Therefore, for science analyses, you should work with the level two products and the data format is NETS CDF. The table above provides a direct comparison of the spectral, spatial, and temporal range and resolutions from among the existing space-based space SIF records. As was stated before, depending on the instrument, there's quite a range and it would be erroneous to study and use single measurements over a given area. However, there is confidence in comparing sources and observing the trends over a given area.
A good resource for the complete collection of existing space-based SIF measurements can be found at the above link. The effort is a NASA-funded measures project led by Dr. Nick Perizu that has assembled a long-term record for SIF from the available data sets. Later on, we will go through examples on how to work with specific data sets and products. In the 2017 science special issue on OCO2, Dr. Ying Sun and others specifically compared the different SIF products over the region near Chicago, Illinois, in the United States. On the left hand side, the images show the various spatial coverage, how they differ, and the trade off between spatial coverage and resolution. Note the wide parcels of lower resolution from GOM, the sparser circular coverage from GOSAT, and the skinny swath, but high resolution data from OCO2. In a later study, on the right hand side images, Dr. Philip Kohler compares Tropomi to GOM and to OCO2 in the Nile River region in Africa. By looking at multiple data sets, you would be able to get a more complete story of a given area. We will now focus specifically on OCO2 and Tropomi. OCO2 is a three-channel grading spectrometer that covers the globe pole to pole over the sunlit areas on a 16-day repeat cycle. OCO2 was designed to retrieve regional changes of carbon dioxide, but similar to previous spectrometers, the oxygen A-band in one of the channels covers the terrestrial SIF spectral region and thus allows OCO2 to also measure SIF. The OCO2 swap is made up of eight parallelogram footprints of 1.29 kilometers each for a total of 10.3 kilometers swath path. This means we have a very precise and small footprints over the regions that get covered. To get the representative values of SIF, the OC2 instrument measures at a given location the intensity of reflected sunlight off the Earth's surface at specific wavelengths. Species in the atmosphere absorb the sunlight at specific wavelengths. So, when light passes through the Earth's atmosphere, the species that are present leave a distinguishing footprint, I'm sorry, distinguishing fingerprint that can be captured. The OCO2 spectrometer, working like cameras, will detect these molecular fingerprints. Then, the absorption levels that are shown in the spectra, like a captured image, will tell us how many molecules were in the region where the instrument measured. Like the XCO2 values, SIF also goes through rigorous validation and comparison to ground tower values. Summarizing some main points relative to SIF retrievals from space. We are able to make the SIF observations because of the spectral range of the many spectrometers available. And we know that by focusing on the detangling of the SIF contribution to the absorbed solar radiances, we can tease out the SIF measurement values. We know that we have to take into account the different windows and strategies because all the spectrometers were designed to measure a mix of atmospheric molecules and species. This is important to know how the SIF values are derived and when you do comparison analyses. There is no single right or wrong way. Researchers have had to adapt approaches to retrieve the most accurate information possible. For more detailed information, please refer to our user guides, which are available in the above links. In addition to the SIF program of records site listed earlier, above are two additional links to FTP sites that will take you directly to the OCO2 and Tropomi data we will be using for the demonstration. The naming convention is standard and similar to most space-based data products. However, we listed the examples for clarification and for your ease of reference. Note that the products will start out with the instrument name, followed by the product name or SIF, the date and the data format. 
Specifics to note changes would include if there is a current build version or if the product is gridded or not gridded. To expand on this further, I will hand things over to Philip. Hi there, my name is Philip Kühler and I will present the tutorial part for Asset's Chlorophyll Fluorescence Workshop here. So I have set up this GitHub directory so that you can follow along and it should work out of the box. So I programmed this in Julia. As in particular, I have used uh, Pluto Notebook, um, which is a package and very similar to IPython Notebooks, which you will see in a second. So first of all, if you haven't done so, you need to install Julia and clone this directory. Then we are going to start Julia, uh, indicating that we want to start it in this um, in this directory with a project. So the meaning of this is I'm just showing you that there are a few files where all the required packages are stored and they will be installed automatically um, once we start up Julia with I haven't copied it yet. Oops. Right. So we have startup Julia. Now um, you would need to use this command package using package the package manager and then the package instantiate to install all the required packages. So in my case it shouldn't do anything, but in your case that may take a while. Okay. So next we are going to use the Pluto package and run the Pluto notebook. So because I'm working remotely, I was setting this launch browser argument to false. Um, you may just leave out this comment and the browser, browser will pop up. Okay. So now we are going to see a link here and because I am working remotely, I made a note here that you would need to SSH first and forward this open port. Um, so the port specified here, we may use any port which is not blocked yet. So I replace my username and the host. So I'm working on this machine called Flu in the GPS division of Caltech. They forward the port. Okay, it seems to work. The next step, we can just go ahead, copy this link, go into our browser, use this link here, and Pluto should start up. So you see this welcome screen, and then you open the first part of this tutorial, which is called demo presentation. JL. So the first startup of Julia can take a while because it's pre-compiling all the packages, um, but do not worry, just follow along here. Um, if you need a break, you can just stop this video and then continue once everything has compiled. So as I said earlier, um, this is very similar to IPython notebooks, so it, uh, it works with so-called cells, so we can just add a cell here. You can type some code and then execute it with a small run button here. You will then also see the time it takes to, to run this kind of code and let's just try it once. So let's say A is 1. Okay, now you see that even in my case uh, it's the compiling all the other cells. So I will do a one minute break and then we continue. Okay, I'm done here with the compiling. So um, if I just type this command with AS1, then you see it's already in this. Let's do another cell where we say B is 1. And then 
another cell where we say what is a plus b is two. So now, if you would if you would like to have more lines in one cell, let's try this little quick. And a plus b, you will get an error message. But it's very convenient. You can just click here, wrap all code in begin end block, and it will show you a two. So this is how this Pluto notebook works. And it's very convenient because in this case it's only running all the cells which are which are dependent on the cell you are working in. So you don't have to rerun everything, um, but Pluto will know which cells it has to rerun once you change something. It has also a very cool feature with this presentation mode. Um, so let's get started. So in this notebook I will show you how to read level 2 satellite data of solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence, um, especially from Tropomi and OCO2 in this tutorial here. Um, we will create a time series over some spatial features, generate spatial composites and evaluate measurement uncertainties. So first, to start up Julia, it needs to load all those um, required packages here, and we switch to a different backend to plot, uh, which is Plotly, so that it is a bit more interactive. Maybe I should increase the size here a bit, so that you see it better on the screen. Um, so you can download the data on our FTP server. I, had, I, I made a link here. Um, so Tropomi was launched in late 2017 and we have now uh, about three years of data. The OCO2 data is also hosted on our FTP server, but you can also download it from the gas disk. After downloading the data, uh, I would like to mention that satellite data is often shared via NetCDF files. So this is a network common data format. Um, and what I do just for convenience, I bundle those files and put them into a tar directory. And the first step is therefore that you just untar those bundled, um, bundled files. So because satellite data has typically a large volume, so I, I wrote here that in case of Tropomi, um, one day has about 4 million observations over land, and that makes, um, even if I compress those files after all, um, we have still a size of 150 megabytes per day, so one month is 3.5 gigabytes. This is also a reason why I work remotely right now, so all those files are stored at Caltech on our server and not on my private machine here. Um, then for this script you have to define the, the directory where you downloaded this package and um, let's just start with OCO2 here. So this is, director, this is the directory. Then we want to get a list of all the files because um, the OCO2 data has several subdirectories for the se separate years and month. Um, I have to use those wildcards here. Um, once this is done, you should get a list with all the different files. They have a specific structure and we want to extract um, the date from this structure. This is done here, so I have just two functions, uh, one for Tropomi and one for OCO2, and it loops through those files, and let's just focus on this right now. Um, we have a file pattern with the year year. So because it was launched after 2000, it's just a two-digit year. Um, that's why I create from all those files one vector with all the dates. So to show you here that this function works, um, it takes 453 milliseconds in this case. And we have now a list of all the available dates. In the next step, we may not need all the files 
but um, let's just start with one year. So we give a start date and a stop date, and then we find all the indices of the files um, which are in between those dates. This is what this function is doing here, or this part is doing. Next, we need to create some spatial features and read them. I have already prepared something here because we want to also evaluate the measurement uncertainty. I have selected a region where we have some vegetation right next to Bear Desert. Um, this is here in California. Um, you may just use your own shapefile. Um, just launch Google Earth. Show that. It's also in the browser. Let's just zoom out a bit. You could go wherever you want and draw some polygons. I have already prepared something. So here are my projects. But what you would need to do for this is in principle uh, draw a line or shape. So I'm just showing it to you once here. So we are looking at this region. Um, in California, right next to the Joshua Tree National Park, um, but you would need to, or you would draw a polygon like this. You can use as many points as you want, and then give it a name. In this case, I already have some. Um, so then you would, you can, you, I have here, this is a vegetation patch, and this is the reference patch, and then you would export this SKML file and uh, now I'm switching back to Julia. So so we so SKML files if you don't know what it is it's uh, the keyhole markup language it's basically a, um, a tag based structure with nested elements and attributes and it's um, some kind of a Subform of XML, the extensive extensible markup language. So it looks a bit like this if you would look into such a file. Um, and those markup languages generally define a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that is human readable and machine readable. So another format which is very similar is JSON. And the specific form of those JSON files are GeoJSON files, which have also an, it's an open standard where you have um, something like feature collection features, um, and then geometry types, and those are all predefined. And you can convert those KML files very easily to GeoJSON file with tools like this one I've linked here. So it's like a dr drag and drop mechanism. So you put in the KML file, you get out the GeoJSON file, and that is understandable by Julia. Okay, I've already done so, and um, it's I have also included it in this uh, tutorial here, so it's just called tropodemo.json. And if you read it with this command, um, so don't be confused here with this read-read, so you need First of all, you need to read the file somehow, but this is then a binary format, and which is interpreted by this GeoJSON read. So it's basically a feature collection, as you have seen in this example before. So now we can, for example, see that it has features, and um, let's say it has two features in this case, but it may have several more. So you are free to choose how many you would like. So in this case, the second one is called reference, and let's just check if it's right. The first one is called vegetation. Okay. Now um, you see how those files look like. You have basically a polygon and then some geometry inside, and here there are the coordinates um, plus the altitude. So we are here only interested in the longitudes and latitudes for now. So I have this small function which pulls all the longitudes and latitudes and put them into tuples. 
we can check if this works out um, by just plotting it here. Now I show you what it means that we have the plotly backend, so you see all the different points here. Okay. Okay. Once this has worked, um, so just to show you, I create this polygon by getting the longitudes and latitudes from the first feature, which was the vegetation, and the second one, which was a reference polygon, and then I just plot both on top of each other. So now we have this huge data volume, and so we want only to pull the necessary data, and for that reason we need a little function which gives us the boundary coordinates plus minus a delta or an epsilon which I defined here. So I'm using, I want to loop through all the different features and get the minimum boundary box. Um, this is what happens here. I put this into, or I pipe this into a data frame. And once you just put in the whole region of interest with all the features inside, then you get the minimum boundary box um, plus minus is 0 0.2 degrees. So now we can go ahead and read the data. But first of all, if you take a look in one of those files, um, you may just do this by open this with the dataset function and um, we use, in this case, all the files. And the first one here, just as an example, to have a look how it looks like. Um, you see all those different things with the comment, unit, long name, and standard name, and uh, a lot of different things here, um, which might not be of interest for you. There are also some um, comments here, what is the meaning? So for example, here, this measurement mode, um, it stated that OCO2 measurement mode, zero means nadir, one means glint, and two is target. And there's also a small comment that users should separate those for the analysis. Okay, we will do that in a minute. So, because we don't need all the things in this file, we can just select some basic things. And there I actually created this small dictionary here, which is also in this JSON format, which you might um, remind or remember um, that it's human readable and machine understandable, or the machine can also read it. So I defined here some things I will use in my all my functions in the remainder, and I will so this left hand side should be fixed, and the right hand side will depend on how the naming in this file in those files is. So if you have here latitude you would say that let is latitude. This is a dictionary for the script to understand what you want to pull from the data. In this case, we use the OCO2 dictionary. Okay. So now we are using data frames here, which makes it very easy to work with tabular data in Julia and its design and functionality is very similar to the functionality of pandas in Python or data frames and data tables in R, if you are more familiar with those programming languages. So to put all of this into a data frame, um, this is a bit more complex and for the sake of time I will just skip through the or just explain what this function is doing. So I created this function with read and see data and it uh, takes as input all the files you want to read, the dictionary and the minimum boundary box. Um, the output will be a data frame eventually. Then here it just loops through all the files and in case there is uh, like a different dimension. So for example, um, one sounding, one satellite sounding has actually corner coordinates, not just the center coordinate. And to, uh, to pull this into this data frame, um, we need 
um, to somehow loop through those dimensions and therefore I have this number names function here. If you are interested or have questions, we have this question and answer session after this. So it returns then um, the output. Maybe worth to mention that I loop through this file, those all those files first, and then I filter only for the the things which are inside the minimum boundary rectangle. Um, but it's it could also be done in a way that you um, read the longitudes and latitudes first and then only select those soundings which are really necessary. But from my experience, it happens that it takes longer than just reading all the data first and kicking out the data which are not relevant for your analysis. Okay, so let's go ahead and read this by just using this. So we populate the data frame with this function read and see data. We use all the files and only those indices which um, correspond to the time of interest, to the time range of interest. We give the dictionary and the minimum boundary box. So this um, will depend on your machine, how long it takes. But now it basically loops through all the files and will um, populate this data frame with um, the things we defined in our dictionary, but only for the region of interest. So again, so depending on the power of your machine or the performance of your machine, um, this would probably take two to three minutes here. I will do a little break here. Okay, it's done. So I show you how long it took. It, for me, it took just 46 seconds. So we have now a list with all the things we wanted. You can actually see all the separate things. And now, because we have seen in this comment of the file that we should only use um, the measurement mode 0, we could filter this by selecting um, only those where it's 0. But there are only a few soundings, and we can do this in a minute or later. But for now, I will just keep all those soundings. Um, as you can see here too, the time is somewhat not in a format which is readable and it's also given in this file itself how the time structure looks like so for Tropomi for example it's UTC in seconds since um, the Unix time and for OCO and then it would be very easy to convert it to a UTC time by just using the Unix to date time command. For OCO2 we have a different time structure. It's seconds since 1993. So what I have to calculate is here an offset to the Unix time, which is 1970. And let's run this. Now we attach a UTC format. And you see it's now we selected 2019. And you see that all those soundings are from 2019. For convenience, we also want to attach the date itself, not only the time. So now we have only the days. So let's run this again. Um, what I wanted to show here is uh, that some of those, because the um, single soundings of a satellite have typically um, a spatial extent to and are not a point. Um, we want to know how much of those soundings is actually over our polygons. And I took here as a reference the, re um, the vegetation polygon and I was just looking at one of those soundings. I can actually zoom in. And this is our sounding here. 
And now we want to know how much of this sounding or how many percent of the soundings are inside this polygon and how many are outside. In this case it's 23%. Point, uh, 23%. And so how do we do this? Um, we need a few functions um, which um, I list here. So we have a function to return the formatted vertices, so the boundaries um, in a specific format so that it's easier to calculate. And we divide um, every every sounding into 100 points and this is done with this single function here and in a in the last step we compute the coverage with a function which is called in polygon um, for the sake of time I will not go through details here but you can ask questions in the question and answer session so what this is doing, I can visualize it at least. Let's here plot all those points. We have 100 points because we divide all those um, lines into 100 points and I just count those points which are inside this polygon. Those are 23, therefore we have a coverage of 23%. So if we have here, we loop through this function get coverage, and this will you make use of all the other functions I defined in this cell here. So now we can actually take a first look at the data. Um, to rerun this. You see it's quite sparse, but in this case I selected. So if you if you uh, want to narrow down, um, if it depends on the size of your region of interest. But sometimes there may not be as many points if you want to have a full coverage that all the soundings lie within your uh, within your region of interest. Um, but that's why you can just check how many um, points are still there. And I, for example, oh, I um, use the 100% of vegetation here, and you see how many soundings are left. In this case, we have still. 560 of all the soundings which kind of touch this region. So we can also go to 1% here. And then we should get the. Uh, this is 0, right? Yeah, sorry, it's 0. And I have not. I have um, done steps of 10% here. Okay. But if you're. This, those 866 would be the, the number of soundings which have at least 1% overlap. But let's stay with at least 80%, so we have some. We see already that those 80% are higher, but you can already see that there is quite some noise inside. For the reference, because it's a bigger region, just define it here to be 100%. So those are the commands to plot it. Good. It's the first l look at the data. Now we need to average the data somehow. And uh, it can happen that it depends on the, on the number of soundings and the, and the average period how your time series will eventually look like. So for example, here with a mean of seven days, um, I will decrease the size here so that you can see what actually happens. So if I say, okay, you want a longer averaging period, it should get smoother with time. And you see really how the temporal pattern changes, right? Uh, 
Now I'm here at almost a month of averaging. You see that there's some, there's uh, the maxima is somewhere here in June. So this temporary averaging, um, you can see how it's done. Um, so it takes the data frame and the number of days we want to average and what we want to average. So you may not even need fluorescence here, but for example, the near infrared reflectance. So you can just uh, pass as an argument that you want the near infrared reflectance if you have selected those in the original uh, dictionary. So it automatically generates the temporal breaks, initializes this averaging um, column, populates the time, and then um, I'm just cleaning up some incomplete timestamps and generate the output and return it. So this is all what's happening. Um, I do it here in this loop where I pass the n days, which are defined over here. So if you change the slider, you will automatically change this n days argument here. Okay. So if, if you want to take a look at this AV, then you see the averaging time, the mean and the standard deviation and the number of observations as an output to give you an overview how reliable those data sets are. And then here the standard deviation and the temporal mean is shown in this orange line. Okay, now we want actually to look at uh, spatial composites. So how does it look like um, when we average those data and want to look at the map? So one comment I have here, so sometimes people use only already the gridded data set and then use those grid boxes and uh, compute their time series from there. But if you have a specific feature with, which is surrounded by a different kind of vegetation, then it makes actually sense to, um, to select this data first, have the time series, but you may want to look at the um, at the spatial um, pattern too. So here you see if I select one month, um, there's not much of, of data for, for OCO2. So let's try it with three months. Let's run it again. For OCO2 it's still not a very good picture here and you can already identify. So if I would just use a grid box and then um, use this value as my average value, it's not as reliable as just going back to the single soundings. So in this case, let's say just all of them. Uh, this is half a month. That we will see this later for Tropomi. But let me. Just use all here for once. So I created this function. We will go through it in a second, um, which is called oversample. So we're using oversampling or oversampling method. Okay, now it should just use all the data, and you still see that there's a small, uh, there there are gaps in the OCO2 data, and here I'm actually. You we can increase the spatial resolution, which with this button, then you see that there there are some stripes here. So as I mentioned earlier, for OCO2, um, it's actually advisable to use only the uh, or to separate those measurement modes between target, glint, and nadir. Um, let's do this. Going back 
hier kleines Filter. And we will have only fewer observations now. So out of here 7000 we get half of them. Technically, this Pluto notebook should automatically identify those cells which it needs to rerun, but sometimes it happens that you are too fast and some of those cells are still running. In the spatial domain, we see that there's actually only one swath. So, as you have seen in the previous talks, OCO2 is rather a sampler and Tropomi is more like a mapper. So, there are gaps between those swaths, and one swath is about 10 kilometers broad. But you can see it, it makes sense that it uh, passes over the vegetation, sees the signal, and then sees no signal on the other sides. But there is still some noise. So that's also one message I want to get across here. Um, because I also want to show the other So this is the part where what happens behind the scenes um, to create this map, this spatial map. So we have to initialize a grid. We generate polygons from those corner coordinates in the sense that Julia understands it. And then we have this oversample function which takes as input the data frame we want to oversample, the target resolution which is defined in this drop down menu, and the minimum boundary rectangle. And then again, what? So, for example, fluorescence, or let's just take a look how the near-infrared reflectance would look like. I think I called it just near, NIR. So that would be the, um, the brightness in the near-infrared. So you see that the desert is very bright here at this spot, but so is vegetation. Still, the desert is non-fluorescent while there's a signal over the vegetation. And go to this function again. So what happens is I loop through all those soundings. I um, attach them to the position in the grid. And then I check if every sounding or if the corner coordinates of every single soundings are within one grid box or if they overlap with several ones. In the easy case that all corners are within this uh, are within the grid box grid cell then um, it's just creating or summing up um, the values in this grid cell, and if not, it, I inflate those points by creating 100 points out of one polygon again, like we have seen in the coverage. And uh, I estimate the weight, so it's just the percentage um, of the grid cell which is covered by this polygon, and then eventually I average everything. This is what happens. Again, just to have a look here. Let's change the resolution to even one kilometer or 0, 0.0 degrees. And voila, you can see that it's actually very nice and visible that you traverse some vegetation uh, while the rest is a bit noisy. And so this measurement noise is shown on this last one. So we would expect some negative values, if you, as you have seen on the first or in this talk already. 
and we can even tell you how much there is. So in case of OCO2 in our reference box where I use only those soundings which are within this reference box we have 239 so it's not a very robust statistic for this small region uh, which will change for Tropomi but um, basically those bars are all the values which occur in the reference box and uh, we also uh, stored the uncertainty estimates and from this we can actually um, show the predicted uncertainty probability distribution function um, which is nothing else than a normal distribution with, with a, a, a mean of zero and then the standard deviation of the 0 0.36 and what we see here for those 239 points um, we get something similar um, but again so 239 soundings is really not much that's why this statistic is a bit screwed uh, for OCO2 in this case okay so let me change So now I want to run the same example but with Tropomi to show you the difference um, and how how improved our estimates are or our spatial resolution and the number of soundings with Tropomi. So we loop through this directory. We have just to change here file names. Now instead of using get OCO2 dates, we are going to use get Tropomi dates. Selecting the date range should have worked already. Yeah, it's the same. Those polygons stay the same as well. Converting, we've already done this part reading the GeoJSON files, we have done it. Computing the minimum boundary box. Now you see this is slightly different here. So it looks different from the OCO2 files, but, but similar. So because this naming is a bit different, we have the Tropo dictionary, so we have to replace this dictionary by Tropomi. is irrelevant. Did I run it? I think so. Okay, now here you see this error message, but don't worry. Uh, you see that it's still in progress by those small lines here and it's in red. So I will come back to you once this is done. Okay, we are done. So and based on this on the time here, um, you can already tell that this data has a bigger volume. So we get 318 seconds instead of 46 seconds, if I remember right. And we have also uh, way more sound soundings for this region. So before we had about if we filter for the measurement mode, we had about 3,000. Um, now we have about 100,000. So because there is no measurement mode in Tropomi, let's just play this out with nothing. Comment it. Okay, let's run the spatial polygon again. Somehow it's still working. Because of this huge data volume, you have to um, be a bit more patient in this case. I will come back to you once it's done. Um, sorry guys, I just recognized that of course we have to change the time here too. 
so otherwise we have dates in the future we don't know that yet how that works out so let's just um, run this again okay let's just stick with those um, things like vegetation coverage is at least 80 percent and the reference coverage is 100 percent so the temporal averaging um, looks also very different. So for a month of data, we have a very smooth picture here, um, but you can see that there's a lot of noise for the single soundings. And um, if we increase the uh, decrease the averaging time period, you will see that it also changes this time series dramatically. So depending on how many soundings you cover, um, I would say as, an, as a rule of thumb, there should at least be 10 soundings within one averaging period. But let's go to like a week. Oops, six, seven days. Right. Then you have all those small wiggles which might correspond to some interesting features, for example droughts or um, precipitation events. Um, we will see this uh, in the second part of the tutorial. If we look now at the spatial map of Tripomi for just for one month, so I just say the month has to be um, May. then you see that this 0.2 resolution grid is not really um, it's, it looks very different and if we go to higher resolutions we should see uh, a more reasonable pattern which corresponds to what we expect so some higher values within our box here and lower values elsewhere so because this data volume is huge we have to be a little bit more patient um, see how long this takes here actually we are now running to 30 seconds and we ended up with 46 seconds just to do this oversampling exercise for 8000 soundings here if we go to an even higher resolution we get actually a more sound picture here but it also takes a little bit longer so right now it was 75 seconds um, again probably our server is busy right now that's why it takes so long sometimes it's faster so it really depends on the performance of your machine um, but let's just do it for this finest resolution I have here in this drop down menu which would be uh, one kilometer roughly see how long it takes okay so that took really long to compute um, a lot of stuff to do in the background here so 407 seconds but you see that it's now a very smooth picture how we would expect um, you can still see that there are some negative values so let's take a look if it's consistent with our uncertainty estimates So we have 8,000 or 9,000 soundings in this reference box here. Um, the predicted uncertainty is of course a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0 0.44. And what we actually observe if we sum up all those 9,000 soundings, um, we have a slightly negative mean, but this is very, very subtle. And the standard deviation is exactly as observed. So I would say it has passed the test of um, the uncertainty estimates. All right, so this is it for the first part. And in the second part, we will get a bit more practical and see how we can relate it to some um, events which happen in the nature. All right, see you in a minute. 
So for this case study, you would need both um, OCO2 and Tropomi data. And you just need to open this uh, case study Illinois here. Um, I already did, did it um, because it will take a while to loop through those files. But so this in this case study, we want to look at the impact of the 2019 Midwest floods on fluorescence over Illinois. So um, if you haven't noticed, the U.S. Midwest experienced a major flooding event in the spring of 2019. So the crop planting got delayed um, by a couple of weeks. And we will see here how it affected the seasonality of photosynthesis over this region. So there's even a New York Times article. Um, we have also an, a, a Caltech article. We'll just show this for a second here. All is linked in this notebook. Um, it basically shows how this has affected the seasonal cycle. And the original article by my colleague Yi Yin et al. Um, is also linked here. So for this exercise, we need a GeoJSON file with all the US states to get the data for Illinois specifically. I have linked the source here. And in principle, we make use of the same functions as in the last, in the first notebook, um, but it will take a moment to loop through all the files for 2019. And if you haven't downloaded it, um, just stick around and look what happens. So we do the same, load the required packages. Then we need to read the boundary coordinates. So all the US states are in this file. Um, which is called via an HTTP request. So we have all the features inside. We want to know all the state names and then we look where Illinois is. We get, we extract Illinois from there and plot it so it makes sense. Now we transfer it to longitude and latitudes to create our minimum boundary box and read the data. So here you, you can look at those functions if you are interested. It's just clicking on this small i. Um, it's basically almost the same, but it's um, divided into Tropomi and OCO2. So what happens is that uh, we want to get one year of data. So there's one function called get one year, um, and all the necessary functions are just inside of all those cells here. So we do this for 2018 to have a comparison and for both Tropomi and OCO2. So this temporal averaging, I start here just with two weeks instead of days and we see even over Illinois um, the data for Tropomi and OCO2 look um, actually very similar but you see uh, that there are fewer soundings, because there are fewer soundings for CO2, um, it's a little bit more noisy. But so if we would increase this averaging period, you see that they kind of convert and we have the 2019 mean. So this flood event delayed the crop planting and we can see that from space um, in the US crop belt combat. You can see that the peak is a bit different if you change this averaging period, but it, it's very similar and robust and consistent. Um, you can also take a look at the paper, what I linked in the beginning here. Let's go back to very high temporal resolution. And that actually shows you again how uh, the difference, how there was a difference and it has a huge, had a huge impact. Um, on this weekly time scale, you see this still in the Tropomi data, while OCO2 um, is a bit more um, volatile, let's say. So if you are interested in how those plots are done, um, this is the code for it. And that's it for this tutorial. Thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much, Philippe.
And before we start, I'd like to make an announcement about the homework. It is on the RSET training page, and that homework is due on April 15th. Again, it's on the RSET training page, and it is due on April 15th. So this is the last session of this four-part series. Uh, we've covered a, a two basic uh, sensor measurements here. One is with LIDAR. The other one is SIF. So it's um, hopefully it gave you a good background knowledge on how to use LIDAR for looking at structural measurements of vegetation and how to use SIF to look at photosynthetic activity. And so what we'll do now is we will uh, be answering the questions you've been typing in the uh, question box. And online, we have uh, Professor uh, Christian Frankenberg, we have uh, Karen Ewan, we have uh, uh, Dr. Philippe Kohler to answer your questions. So we've been gathering those questions on the Google Doc that you see on your screen. And if you have any further questions, just keep typing them in the question box. If we don't get to all of the questions, we will be answering um, we will be answering them on the document, which we will be posting online in a couple of days. All right, so with that, then uh, let's get started and let's wait, uh, work our way down these questions. All right, so the first question, what are the differences between physical and data-driven methods? I don't know whether Philip wants to take that question or whether I should. Um, I can try to respond. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Please go ahead. <laughs> it sounds like almost too loud. Um, in principle, these are just two different retrieval mechanisms that we imply. So with physical, we often mean that we model and fit fluorescence more on based on first principles. That means that we assume a theoretical solar spectrum and we have a well-defined instrument line shape that we can actually use to convolve our solar spectrum with and thereby generate synthetic data. And we call this whole process kind of an instrument model. All we need then is some kind of assumption about the spectral shape of SIF. And then all of this can be constructed into a simple so-called forward model with which we can um, generate synthetic measurements that we use for our retrieval process. In the data-driven approach, we are actually training our instrument model from data itself. So we are basically using actual data from on-orbit satellite measurements, typically over fluorescence-free scenes to train our instrument model, like what this, it includes parts of everything that's going on in the detector. Most importantly, the spectral line shape um, that basically determines how each detector sees a Fraunhofer line. And this, is, this method is typically done when we use larger spectral ranges as subtle instrument features can really affect the retrievals and often we find that we can better capture the instrument models by training the model using actual data. Great, thank you. Question number two, can we use Python or R to process OCO2 data? What is your suggestion to process the data in those platforms? Uh, that's a good question. Of course, you should be using the, the tools that you're most familiar with. That's often the easiest way. Sometimes it's worthwhile to make a switch, but if you are an expert in Python or R, we don't want you to change your main processing platform. Um, so you can access NetCDF data in any of these tools, in any of these scripting languages, as long as you have a NetCDF or HDF5 library installed. And then you can work from there. We have even some examples on the website that we specified there on the document, github.com, cfranken, slash sif underscore tools, where um, both Philip and me provided some R scripts as well as Python scripts as well. Philip actually moved from R towards Julia, and I moved more from Python towards Julia. So we both have, <laughs> I never touched R before, but Philip has some experience. so. We are both converts, but we don't want force want to force anyone else to become a convert. Great. So, question number three: How important is it to evaluate the performance of SIF against the Eddy covariance flux tower GPP measurements? 
it depends on how you define important. I would say comparing CIF against flux tower observations is actually the best possible way to fully understand um, how CIF uh, really works and how it relates to GPP at the larger canopy scale. Uh, so towards that goal, I would say these measurements are really crucial. But in some aspects, it might work at the leaf level even better because there you're actually measuring the same thing. Um, <clears throat> ironically, I would say on the flux tower side, we have the opposite problem from the satellites. <laughs> in the case of a flux tower, our fluorescence footprint that we do measure from the tower optically might actually capture a much smaller area in the vicinity of like a couple of meters around the tower um, than the actual flux tower footprint. Whereas from the satellite, we are covering a much, much larger area than the satellite footprint. So these are some of the caveats that, that people also have to bear in mind, especially if there's kind of heterogeneous vegetation within, within the eddy covariance flux tower footprint, which can be hundreds of meters. Okay, question number four. Why do you prefer to use Julia? And what is the advantage of using Julia? Can't we use Python instead? And what are the advantages of Pluto over Jupiter or R markdown? That's again a, a good question. As, as I mentioned before, you should use the language of your choice. Um, the basic principles of data processing remain exactly the same. And I think Philip has nicely shown some of the basic principles how you would kind of get started. Um, we have switched a lot of work in, in our group over to Julia, mostly for its speed and simplicity. Um, because it allows us to achieve production-like speed, especially for grading routine, this was important. So it, it works equally fast as a compiled language like C and Fortran, but it's still as easy to use as Python or R. Um, but again, this can be a personal choice and you have to decide for yourself. I would say that uh, the advantage of Pluto over Jupiter is that it is more interactive. For instance, if you change like the variable A, like Philip mentioned somewhere, it will be propagated through all the cells that will actually use the variable A later on. And the order will be kind of internally stored. Um, so some of the caveats that you sometimes come up with in no notebooks are more elegantly handled in Pluto in my mind. But again, this is, you can work with whatever you wanna work. Eventually these notebooks are nice for showing the principles if you wanna really work in a more production framework, he will probably work on pure scripts anyhow and not, not necessarily in notebooks. So along those lines, are there any plans to eventually upload these data onto something like GEE, Google Earth Engine? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would have to Think about that. Yeah, in principle, level three data could be uploaded there. I don't think Google Earth Engine will necessarily take individual data. So an indiv there's this caveat there that in a single fluorescence measurement from Tropomi or any other sensor does not always make the same kind of sense as a single Landsat pixel would have, just because a single measurement is so noisy. And we always have to average a few of them. So this is kind of the tricky part of that answer where I'm not yet sure whether it actually makes sense to access single data via Google Earth Engine. So often you have to do exactly what Philip did in the notebook that you actually have to co-add some data to beat down the noise and get a reasonable signal out. So that's the fundamental difference from like a hyperspectral imager where you just have band ratios and reflectance they are not really noisy. Okay. Question five, is it possible to map dormant volcanoes lithology by fluorescence of some minerals or only lithological mapping could be inferred somehow from active volcano emissions? Philip, I don't know whether you wanna take this or you might have. Maybe he's not the microphone issues. Let me just feel free to chime in, Philip, at any time. Um, typically, volcanoes are not necessarily a non-fluorescent, um, but some minerals can indeed luminesce. Um, 
typically the luminescence signal is a lot weaker than vegetation fluorescence. And for most minerals, the luminescence is actually not necessarily taking part in this 750 nanometer range, but more on the visible spectral range. Um, so in general, the signal is much more faint than what we observe for vegetation fluorescence, and we would even need many more um, data sets um, to actually average this out. Sorry, my son just came in and needed to pick something here. <laughs> All right, question number six. In the last session of the SIF data, were referred to as retrievals. The SIF data were referred to as retrievals. In this session, they're being referred to as soundings. Is there a difference? It, it's just the terminology that we switch back and forth. Probably in the framework here, I would say you can use sounding or retrieval as almost synonymous. In both cases, they are related to a single measurement from the satellite. And what we strictly speaking would mean by retrieval is the process by which we compute fluorescence from the actual spectra for each sounding. So with sounding we mean like a single measurement from the satellite and then that might be associated with the retrieved fluorescence value for that sounding or with the spectrum from that sounding. So it's mostly referring to a single single measurement point so to say. Okay, question but if we talk seven. about averaging soundings or retrievals, and if we say that, we mean the same thing. All right, question number seven. I'm not very comfortable using uh, GIS remote sensing softwares. Can you share or show in, Gip, in the GitHub repository a demo on processing the net CDF data to extract a time series over a region of interest? Um, yes, we have put some code for the tutorial that we have here on GitHub pages and they will be linked in the final responses and maybe Brock can also post them on the chat. And we have further examples on the two other repositories. One is kind of more SIF tools repository to access um, data individually. And then we have a tool in Julia with which we can grid data as well, purely written in Julia. Um, once you have level three data in that CDF, there's various tools with which you can actually access it and even get time series over like a specific let long location. Um, we can provide some further links to that, but most often if you really don't want to use any scripting language, you will most likely have to work with the gridded data sets and not with individual data sets. Okay, question number eight. Is there a way to link SIF with LAI? Um, yes, that's always an interesting way, similarly to linking SIF with NDVI. Um, in principle, you would need to download an LAI data set and co-locate both data sets. And there's various strategies. The easiest would be to use, to grid them all on the same spatial, spatial and temporal resolution and then work from there. Question number nine, uh, can SIF data be used to study vegetation phenology? Yes, um, mostly because, because um, phenology strongly impacts the amount of absorbed radiation by chlorophyll. So that's perfectly being captured in the fluorescent seasonal cycle. Um, over crop areas, that's probably the, the the strongest vegetation phenology where things are even being harvested and completely cut down over the winter period. Sometimes you have winter, winter crops in some areas, but it's basically a very narrow phenology where crops grow incredibly fast in their growing season, but then they're being harvested shortly thereafter. So these very distinct, highly peaked seasonal cycles in phenology, we can capture very well with fluorescence, but it's mostly driven, as we said before, by changes in the amount of absorbed radiation by chlorophyll. Question 10, can we use a shapefile directly instead of a KML to define the area of interest? I think Philip answered that question um, and Philip always feel free to chime in on the microphone, but I think he's working on a Linux computer, which is a little bit more complicated in this software. 
uh, yes, you can use the Pluto notebook. Um, and if your shapefile is a GeoJSON file, you can directly work from that. Otherwise, there are other pack packages that you may use to read shapefiles in a different format or convert to a GeoJSON first. But in principle, there should be routines that where you can work with shapefiles shape and the corner coordinates of a satellite pixel directly. Like every GIS software has the so-called in polygon function where you can basically check whether an actual footprint is within your shapefile or not. All right, question 11. Can OCO2 sift light? be extracted more easily. In uh, the documentation, Panoply is recommended, but I cannot get the daily SIF 757 nanometer. Also, once I downloaded a subset of a specific area, it, it's just a non-geo-referenced stripe, and it's not even, not every 16 days, but daily. So I don't understand the temporal resolution. Okay, um, the OCO2 SIF light product is a level two product. Um, what that means is that it will give you a measurement point for each and every single sounding, I'm using that word again, from OCO. What is basically done in the SIF light product is help you a little bit by not splitting up all the data into the satellite orbits, which is what typically is being done on level two data, raw data, so to say. Um, but combining all the different orbits per day into a single daily file. In that sense, it's not yet gridded at all. Um, so it just provides you all the orbital overpasses over a single day. That's why it looks like non-geo-referenced stripes. <laughs> um, so it does not have any necessary temporal resolution. It just combines all the data on that single day during the time of overpass. Um, what we do is the gridding routine that I mentioned before can ingest these OCO2 SIF light products, and then you can specify what spatial and temporal resolution you want to have your final product in. But for that, I would um, advise you to go to our gridding tool, which is on github.com slash cfranken slash gridding. We can help to some degree as well, um, get you set up, and some le um, level three gridded products are also on our FTP server. So along those lines, can you then remind us the data, the SIF data, the OCO2 SIF data that was used in this demo um, versus the light product? Oh, give me one second. I, I somehow lost the... Um, bu -bu -bu -bu. Sorry, um, Erica, can you repeat that question, please? Yeah, can you remind us which uh, SIF data set was used in this demo? Oh, these were, if you look at individual data, these were the level two data sets for Tropomi and some and level that, two data for OCO, I think. Okay, so it wasn't the light product. Um, it was for OCO2, it is, is, is always the light product because we advise people to just use the light product which is a little bit easier to use than the raw data, which we don't want people to necessarily use. Okay. Uh, question 12, can you also explain the level three products? Um, it's a little tricky because there are no official level three products. Um, we, once you run like these grading tools that we make available in principle the outcome of this is some kind of level three product <laughs> with the advantage that you can be in control on the spatial and temporal resolution that's everyone has some slightly different needs that's why we often don't provide all of this um, so what level three products basically means it's it's a higher level product than the individual soundings and it's being kind of average both in space and time at an appropriate resolution. So Philip, maybe we can add a link somewhere to an example of a gridded product um, from Tropomi and or OCO so that people can actually take a look at how in level three product that has like, let's say two years of data in one file at an eight day or one month temporal resolution would look like because then you can use it and open it up in Panoply and just play around a little bit. 
it's often the quickest way to get a good idea. Okay, question number 13. How does GOM2 SIF retrieval perform in comparison to OCO2 and Tropomi? Um, tricky question. Um, in principle, it's relatively similar to Tropomi from its measurements. It has a slightly different signal to noise ratio. So in principle, Tropomi is a newer satellite, so it has better, better <laughs> detector characteristics. So it's more closely aligned with Tropomi. Um, however, in the Tropomi retrieval, we can actually use a much narrower spectral range. So this is one key advantage where even on a single sounding, the Tropomi measurements should be a little bit more reliable. The biggest disadvantage of GOM2 is that the footprints are very large. And I think they are more on the order of like 80 kilometers to 100 kilometers, whereas for Tropomi, we now have five kilometer rich footprints. So we have much more data for Tropomi and we have a better accuracy for an individual sounding. So we can go to much finer spatial and temporal resolution with Tropomi data. OCO2 from the retrieval point of view is the most accurate because it has the by far the highest spectral resolution. Uh, we can use the more physics-based retrievals um, and a very narrow micro window to fit fluorescence. But it comes at the expense of not being a real mapper, as Philip mentioned, but we have a relatively narrow swath. Um, but across that swath, we will actually have very good measurements. Right, so that is the end of our questions. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like that's it. So I'd like to close by uh, thanking our guest speakers, uh, Christian Frankenberg, Philip Kohler, Karen Yuan, and uh, also uh, reminding you that if you have any questions, please send them to me and I will then um, make sure I send them to the right person in, in order to be able to answer your question. Um, all right, so this was a, a, a very jam-packed uh, webinar series. We had a lot of guest speakers. Uh, you learned about LIDAR, um, ISAT-2, uh, JEDI, uh, SIF, and then OCO2 and Tropomi demo. I'd like to uh, thank all of our guest speakers, uh, Cole Creevel on JEDI, Nick Kotlinski, Amy Neuschwander on ISAT-2, and all of the ISAT-2 team members that joined the Q&A, as well as the JEDI um, science team members that joined the Q&A. Um, and so I'd like to also thank the RSET team. We have an incredible team here that uh, supports these sessions. And, and thanks to them, all of this is possible. There's a lot of work that goes into this, uh, starting with David Barbato, Jonathan O'Brien, Selwyn hudson Odoi. Uh, the amazing Brock Blevins, and of course, our uh, incredible program manager, Anna Prados. And uh, last but not least, uh, thanks to all of you for uh, tuning in and uh, for always uh, showing such great inter interest in, in these uh, new and emerging topics. Um, so before I close, uh, uh, Karen, uh, Philip, or Christian, would you like to say anything? Everyone is on mute. <laughs> I, I can say a few words and then uh, hopefully Karen and Philip can say something themselves. Um, this has been fun. It's great to see so many people curious and interested in this and hopefully we can entice more people to actually use remote sensing data and get at least partially inspired by what we are doing and then follow into our footsteps and go way beyond that and use it in exciting research. Hi, this is Karen here. I agree with uh, Christian, and I want to thank everyone for their participation today. And if possible, I certainly would extend the questioning to folks if there's there are other areas that they're interested in looking at or other questions of how just how to use SIF and, and you know what we can do to help you work with the data. 
it's important to find out directly from you what you can and cannot do with it so we can um, maybe do another training or something. But we, we don't know what we don't know. So it would be great if you could let us know um, what you're having trouble with. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen and Philip uh, and uh, Christian. Philip, what you? I think Philip might be having audio issues. Um, so thank you very much, Karen. I I second what you say. I mean, this is just an introductory, and hopefully we will bring all of you some more in-depth trainings in the future. It's important that you fill out the survey that we will be providing each and every one of you, and let us know what sort of in-depth trainings you would like to see as related to LIDAR and SIP. So with that, I will close the session. Again, thank you very much. And don't forget the homework is due on April 15th. Wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye.